United States conducted their largest ever joint war games. We saw the Balikatan exercises fielding more than 17,000 troops, not only from the Philippines and the United States, but also from a lot of allied and partnered nations. We had observers from Australia, from Japan, the United Kingdom, and the message was quite clear that the Philippines and United States are taking their bilateral relationship to new heights and new levels. It's not just the size of the Balikatan exercises which is an important thing to keep in mind. 17,600 troops is more than twice what we had in previous years. But it's also the nature of military exercises between the Philippines, the United States, and other allied nations who were there as observers. For instance, the two allies actually simulated the sinking of a vessel of an adversary country. Of course, they didn't mention that it's China, but everyone knows that given the location of the exercises, the location of the war games, this had a lot to do with the disputes in the West Philippine Sea or the South China Sea. The two sides also deployed state-of-the-art weapon systems, including the Patriot missile systems that the United States has been using or fielding in order to deal with adversaries across the world. So both in terms of size and nature of exercises, this was truly historic. But the question is, what is the implication of this for U.S.-Philippine relationship? In fact, the bigger question is, what is the implication of the largest ever Balikatan exercises in recent memory for the Philippine-U.S.-China triangular relationship? Is this provocative? Is this for deterrence? Does this have to do with the West Philippine Sea and South China Sea disputes? Or is this also about Taiwan? That's what we're going to find out in our interview today with the Executive Director for Balikatan Exercises, Colonel Mike Lohiko. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself first, uh, Colonel? Mm -hmm. To a lot of us, you're well known, especially those people who are in media or write a lot about the Philippines. What's going on? How did you end up in your current executive agent position? Um, I'd like to ask that myself. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, well, I'm a, a colonel in the Philippine Army. Uh, Philippine Army. Yes. Right. Yeah, just to get the uh, my My current position right now, uh, on my day job, I'm the director of the Joint and Combined Training Center. Which does what specifically for? I, I train mm -hmm. the, well, my center trains units, particularly the Unified Commands and the Joint Task Forces, right. to get them to that level of proficiency on joint operations. Right. So what are joint, what's, what's a joint operation? Exactly. It's, it's, uh, it's a military operation where you have more than one service component involved. So if you have the Army right. operating together with the Air Force, then that's a joint operation. If you have the Air Force operating with the Navy, that's a joint operation. So multi-domain. Yes. Uh, that's the other term I can't yes. hear about it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So in the progression of a of an officer's career, they first have to be proficient in their uh, single component operations. Like uh, if you go from lieutenant right. to captain to major, you have to be proficient in uh, in. If you're in the army, you have to be proficient in ground operations. So they make use of a lot of combined arms operations, right. the infantry with the cavalry, the armor, and the artillery. The same is true when it comes to the Navy and the Air Force. So uh, when uh, officers progress beyond uh, the rank of lieutenant colonel, uh, carrying over to the rank of colonel, they have to be proficient in joint operations. They have to work well with the other right. service components. See, So uh, my job, is to train people and to train units on jointness, on uh, the, the doctrine of jointness. Right. We have to be proficient in working together. Uh, part of my job is also to conduct exercises. So it's not just lectures, it's uh, practical exercises, field training exercises. Uh, they come in many forms. Sometimes we do tabletop exercises, staff exercises involving the uh, staff of commanders, right. and we also do command post exercises. We simulate uh, a major operation without the troops. At the very end of the extreme, uh, at the very extreme, uh, we do field training exercises. So it's not just the planning, but also in the execution. And that's where 
uh, Balikatan comes in. Right. Uh, this is probably the most complicated of all exercises. And the most high profile, right? I mean... Well, yes. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about the history of Balikatan? When did this start? Uh, what was the nature? What was the purpose behind Balikatan, and how it has evolved over time? Not only during the four or five years that you have been directly mm -hmm. involved with it, but based on your understanding of the arc of the exercises. Okay. So, ano ang neto? I mean, ano ang bag na exercises yeah, okay. yeah. So uh, Balikatan is one of the lines of effort of the Mutual Defense Security Board and engagement. the Security yeah. Engagement Board. You know? Uh, the objective here uh, of Balikatan is to uh, gain interoperability, is to demonstrate interoperability right. between the AFP and its partner ally, which right. is the United States. So this is mega coordination. So yes, if you're teaching between different branches of the Philippine Armed Forces, this is between armed forces of multiple countries. Yes, yeah. precisely. Yeah. So the, the complication Excellent. is uh, magnified. Uh, because you're not only doing it among the three right. services, you're also, you'll also have to do it with a partner ally. Uh, so that is the objective of Balikatan, to get us to that level of proficiency where we can operate uh, together with the other service components and uh, we can also operate together with a treaty ally. Uh, which is the reason why uh, Balika, when you say Balikatan, it's almost always tied in with the Mutual Defense Treaty. Because the Mutual Defense Treaty uh, is that, uh, is that uh, instrument that mm -hmm. enables us to, uh, tells us practically that we have to train together if, you, if you're expecting to fight together. Mm -hmm. See. And when was the first Balikatan and, and why is it so big? Why are Balikatan exercises generally big? We, we'll talk about later on why this year is super big. But last year was what, 8,700, 900? Yes, yes. So usually it's around six, seven, eight thousand, 8,000, right? That's a lot of people. Why is Balikatan the like mother of all exercises? At least this yeah, is what well, it appears outside. Yeah, yeah. In this this particular Balikatan, uh, we're calling it the Super Bowl of exercises. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So one way of putting <laughs> it. Especially yeah. if the Americans uh, describe it. Right, they they right. describe it in their terms. So they, they call it the Super Bowl of exercises. Um, okay. Uh, uh, once upon a time, we used to have U.S. bases. Right. Until right. 1992, yeah. essentially. And then yeah. after that, uh, well, even during the time that we had U.S. bases, we also had training together. Mm -hmm. no? And uh, Was there something as big as Balikatan uh, uh, during the Cold War? Not, not, not so much. You know? mm -hmm. But uh, since uh, sometime it was 1991 where uh, we, it's a combination of factors. Of course, uh, yeah. And then also to to add to that, you also had uh, the Mount Pinatubo eruption. Right. It, uh, End of sort Cold of, War. it sort of hastened yeah. up the, the removal of the U.S. bases, uh, but you still had the Mutual Defense Treaty. Right. Okay. So uh, the natural offshoot of that is uh, in the absence of those of uh, of their actual presence, we we have to train uh, together uh, to to get us to that. Uh, level of proficiency to that level of uh, uh, of confidence that we can actually execute a, a an operation together. Now, uh, through the years, uh, we've gone from tactical level exercises uh, at the level of the squad, right. uh, individuals, uh, soldiers' individual skills, and then we build that up to larger formations, from squad to company, battalion. And practically, what you're looking at now is uh, probably the most ambitious of all right. exercises because now we're uh, practically involving a lot of the a lot of units from the different unified commands. So now we have uh, exercises that are happening in the Visayas. We right. have exercises that are happening in Palawan and also in the island of Luzon. Um, so this is so uh, in multi-domain, multi-theater. In a sense, yes. right? The multi topography, very different kind of topography, yes. different kind of operations. Yes, uh, and we're doing it in the diff uh, We're also including cyber defense. Right. So we're already uh, recognizing the cyber domain right. as one of the areas that uh, we have to we have to focus on. Most of our command and control systems uh, to include intelligence, right. surveillance, uh, that. Those, those things uh, fall under the cyber domain. And the vulnerab vulnerabilities that exist in the civilian cyber domain also bleeds over to our, to our capabilities as well. So we have to, uh, we cannot ignore that uh, the cyber domain 
is one of the areas where uh, military interest uh, needs to focus on. Colonel, before again going to the latest, I, uh, the reason I'm asking about the background and all is because I want people to appreciate what's going on here. Mm. I want people to appreciate that there's a conscious, concerted, systematic effort by the Armed Forces of the Philippines not only to work more effectively with our allies, especially U.S., but also to modernize itself, to be more capable in waging or conducting modern warfare. Yes. What is your understanding over time? Is the Philippines moving in the right direction? The reason I'm asking this, Colonel, is because I see a lot of layman, you know, s- nonsense out there. Like this idea is, ah, AFP, ano lang yan, Indian ready for 21st century. AFP, mm. wala tayong nakuha sa mga Amerikano after all of those years. I know the reality is far more complicated mm. than that. And I would say even more optimistic and encouraging than that. What do you say to a lot of people outside there who don't seem to appreciate all the efforts you guys are putting in, all the improvements you have well, been undergoing? My, yeah, my simple answer to that is... If, you're, if you were tasked mm-hmm. to defend the country, to put your life on the line, uh, to, to defend the nation, wouldn't you take every advantage available mm-hmm. to you? Right. Uh, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you use every advantage available to you for, for you to execute your mandate? And the, if the answer is yes, then you have to train with the treaty ally. Because it would be stupid not to. Okay, uh, I compare uh, this type of exercise uh, to that of an athlete who right. wants to who wants to train to be a world class athlete. To okay, qualify let's, let's, for Olympics. Yes, uh, let, let's pick uh, a sport. Okay, right. uh, it is possible for you to train alone. Uh, like if you're if you want to swim, right. yeah, you can you can learn how to swim all by yourself. All you have to do is just buy the best books in swimming, mm. uh, watch the best videos on swimming. YouTube, yeah. And you're probably going to learn how to swim. Yeah, but chances are you're not going to be a world-class swimmer uh, unless you have to train with a world-class coach, unless you train with a world-class partner. Right. Okay? Because why? Well, you need somebody to pace you. You need somebody to motivate you. You need someone to point out your bad habits. Only then you could break mm-hmm. that glass ceiling and uh, uh, create a benchmark right. of what you want to become. The gold standard. Yes, precisely. Right. I mean, look, even the best athletes, uh, Manny Pacquiao had to right. get a world-class coach. Right. He had to get a world-class uh, sparring partner mm-hmm. right? Uh, to get to where he is right now. But Karina, what about those who say that, well... Um, okay, it, in theory, it makes sense, but there's also the threat of dependency. You know, I mean, I mean, you can always get the best coach, etc. But if mm. you're not making the most out of that, you end up as just being independent on the best coach or best partner. Uh, what do you say mm. about people who are saying that all of these exercises we have with the I US? I think we have too much pride. We have mm. too much pride to be overly dependent. Right. A lot of our soldiers, the way they carry themselves, and, and this is what mm. I always remind them, you know. Uh, please, I please tell ahead, them yeah. that when we train together with the Americans, keep in mind, you're not worse or better than them. We're see partners. yourself as yeah. equals. You, right. you have to see yourselves as their equals. Uh, we are just as good as they are. And sometimes we may even be better at certain, certain respects. Remember, we fought side by side. World War II. Right. We've uh, distinguished ourselves uh, in the Korean War. And we have years of combat experience. Uh, isn't that something mm-hmm. uh, Isn't that something that we uh, should... Well, I'm not saying that we should be proud of it, but uh, isn't that something? Isn't that something? Obviously, there are concerns that the Armed Forces of the Philippines for a very long time was focused on domestic insurgency. There are concerns about bureaucratic corruption, all of the problems we have had in the past. But in fairness, in fairness, since 2011 with the revised AFP modernization, it looks like we are moving towards becoming much more modern 21st century armed forces. What is your understanding of what we're getting right and where we can still do better 
in terms of the AFP modernization for the 21st century? Because, I, of course, President Ramos really was the first one who pushed for yes. this back in the 1990s. I'm, I'm yeah. an army guy, right. right? I'm an army guy. So, of the <laughs> uh, if if I just think about the army, right. yeah, modernization, since the bulk of the AFP budget yeah. are colored green, yeah, yeah we have to... Uh, we have to modernize the army. What we're getting right now is we're focusing also on the, Navy, on the Navy and, and Air the Air Force. Force. Yeah. Recognizing the fact that uh, in a modern defense force, you have to have a, uh, a robust joint force. And you cannot achieve that unless you have a very strong Navy right. and a strong Air Force. And we're an archipelagic country. Especially uh, yeah, that. Yeah, lines are as big as yeah. Russia's almost, yeah, especially right? Especially that. Yeah. No, we are an archipelagic exactly, country. Yeah. <laughs> our our borders are not land borders; they're maritime borders. Exactly, yeah. To protect that, yeah, you need the navy. You need the navy to protect that. You know? What we're getting right is that we are now focusing on modernizing our navy and our air force. Mm -hmm. You see, as a, well, ako, I'm, I cons even though I'm in the army, I, I consider myself uh, service agnostic. Right. Yeah. I. I Whichever see, works best for the country. Precise, exactly. Precisely. Yeah. You know, uh, what we're what we're looking at is uh, we're trying to change the culture of the AFP. Uh, instead of uh, seeing ourselves as oh I'm army, I'm navy, I'm air right. force. Now we see how, we tribal. Have to, yeah. yeah, we have to see ourselves as a defense force. Are we moving the red? I don't want to put you on the spot, but time on Filipino. No, I mean we come from the north. There's this idea of you know. Yeah. You know, what I'm saying? It, it, it's just part of our political culture, right? I don't think this is an AFP thing. It's a very Filipino thing. Uh, I'm trying to change the culture. Exactly. Uh, actually, uh, we are trying to change right. the culture. Uh, when we when we train our students uh, in the Command and General Staff right. College, we, we like to encourage them. Uh, when we come together, let's not call ourselves Army, Navy, Air Force. Right. Okay. Let's call ourselves the land, the ground, the maritime, and the air components. Air Force, yeah. Components. Ground component, air component, maritime component. The word component is essential eh? because if you start using it in your in in planning right. conversations, uh, the term component already signifies that I'm part of a larger effort. Mm -hmm. You see, I'm not, I don't provide all the capabilities of the effort, but I provide crucial capabilities of the effort. And I, I need to rely on the maritime and the air component as well. You see, you start with that, and then you develop a culture for planning. Right, so it's and not just getting the best weapons for Navy and Air Force, it's also about reorienting the mindset yes, of precisely. everyone, including the Army, especially precisely. the Dominant Army. And it also involves that. mutual respect between, between, branches, officer, yeah. between officers uh, belonging to the different uh, service components. You know. I have to I have to look at my brother navy officer right. and I have to respect his I have to respect his expertise and I have to respect him as a professional. It starts from there. Right. And then once we get that the habit of uh, looking at ourselves as uh, as professional war fighters then we we develop a culture Although, of course, healthy rivalry will always be there. I mean, for some of us who watch Top Gun, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like even within Air Force, there's going to be rivalry, etc. Yes, cetera. Uh, rivalry to an, to an yeah. extent, if it drives you to do better, that's, that's good.